Office of the Inspector General U.S. Department of Justice Oversight Asterisk Integrity Asterisk Guidance A review of various actions by the Federal Bureau of Investigation and Department of Justice in advance of the 2016 Election Oversight and Review Division 18-04 June 2018 2 Executive Summary A review of various actions by the Federal Bureau of Investigation and Department of Justice in advance of the 2016 Election Decisions to enter into letter use or Queen for a Day Immunity Agreements with three witnesses, the use of consent agreements and act of production immunity to obtain the laptops used by Clinton's attorneys, Cheryl Mills and Heather Samuelson, to cull her personal and work-related emails, and the handling of Clinton's interview on July 2, 2016. With regard to these investigative decisions, we found, as detailed in Chapter 5, that the mid-year team, sought to obtain evidence whenever possible through consent but also used compulsory process, including grand jury subpoenas, search warrants and 2703-D orders, court orders for non-content email information, to obtain various evidence. We found that the prosecutors provided justifications for the preference for consent that were supported by department and FBI policy and practice, conducted voluntary witness interviews to obtain testimony including from Clinton and her senior aides, and did not require any witnesses to testify before the grand jury. We found that one of the reasons for not using the grand jury for testimony involved concerns about exposing grand jurors to classified information, did not seek to obtain every device, including those of Clinton's senior aides, or the contents of every email account through which a classified email may have traversed. We found that the reasons for not doing so were based on limitations the mid-year team imposed on the investigation's scope, the desire to complete the investigation well before the election, and the belief that the foregone evidence was likely of limited value. We further found that those reasons were, in part, in tension with Comey's response in October 2016 to the discovery of Clinton emails on the laptop of Anthony Weiner, the husband of Clinton's former deputy chief of staff and personal assistant, Huma Obedin, considered but did not seek permission from the department to review certain highly classified materials that may have included information potentially relevant to the mid-year investigation. The classified appendix to this report describes in more detail the highly classified information, its potential relevance to the mid-year investigation, the FBI's reasons for not seeking access to it, and our analysis granted letter use immunity and slash or queen for a day immunity to three witnesses in exchange for their testimony after considering, as provided for in department policy, the value of the witness's testimony, the witness's relative culpability, and the possibility of a successful prosecution, used consent agreements and act of production immunity to obtain the culling laptops used by Mills and Samuelson in part to avoid the uncertainty and delays of a potential motion to quash any subpoenas or search warrants. We found that these decisions were occurring at a time when Comey and the mid-year team had already concluded that there was likely no prosecutable case and believed it was unlikely the culling laptops would change the outcome of the investigation, asked Clinton what appeared to be appropriate questions and made use of documents to challenge Clinton's testimony and assess her credibility during her interview. We found that, by the date of her interview, the mid-year team and Comey had concluded that the evidence did not support criminal charges, absent a confession or false statement by Clinton during the interview, and that the interview had little effect on the outcome of the investigation, and allowed Mills and Samuelson to attend the Clinton interview as Clinton's counsel, even though they also were fact witnesses, because the mid-year team determined that the only way to exclude them was to subpoena Clinton to testify before the grand jury an option that we found was not seriously considered. We found no persuasive evidence that Mills' or Samuelson's presence influenced Clinton's interview. Nevertheless, we found the decision to allow them to attend the interview was inconsistent with typical investigative strategy. For each of these decisions, we analyzed whether there was evidence of improper considerations, including bias, and also whether the justifications offered for the decision were a pretext for improper but unstated, considerations. The question we considered was not whether a particular investigative decision was the ideal choice or one that could have been handled more effectively, 
but three executive summary a review of various actions by the Federal Bureau of Investigation and Department of Justice in advance of the 2016 election whether the circumstances surrounding the decision indicated that it was based on considerations other than the merits of the investigation. If a choice made by the investigative team was among two or more reasonable alternatives, we did not find that it was improper even if we believed that an alternative decision would have been more effective. Thus, a determination by the OIG that a decision was not unreasonable does not mean that the OIG has endorsed the decision or concluded that the decision was the most effective among the options considered. We took this approach because our role as an OIG is not to second-guess valid discretionary judgments made during the course of an investigation, and this approach is consistent with the OIG's handling of such questions in past reviews. In undertaking our analysis, our task was made significantly more difficult because of text and instant messages exchanged on FBI devices and systems by five FBI employees involved in the mid-year investigation. These messages reflected political opinions in support of former Secretary Clinton and against her then-political opponent, Donald Trump. Some of these text messages and instant messages mixed political commentary with discussions about the mid-year investigation and raised concerns that political bias may have impacted investigative decisions. In particular, we were concerned about text messages exchanged by FBI Deputy Assistant Director Peter Strzok and Lisa Page, special counsel to the Deputy Director, that potentially indicated or created the appearance that investigative decisions were impacted by bias or improper considerations. As we describe in Chapter 12 of our report, most of the text messages raising such questions pertain to the Russia investigation, which was not a part of this review. Nonetheless, the suggestion in certain Russia-related text messages in August 2016 that Strzok might be willing to take official action to impact presidential candidate Trump's electoral prospects caused us to question the earlier mid-year investigative decisions in which Strzok was involved, and whether he took specific actions in the mid-year investigation based on his political views. As we describe Chapter 5 of our report, we found that Strzok was not the sole decision-maker for any of the specific mid-year investigative decisions we examined in that chapter. We further found evidence that in some instances Strzok and Page advocated for more aggressive investigative measures in the mid-year investigation, such as the use of grand jury subpoenas and search warrants to obtain evidence. There were clearly tensions and disagreements in a number of important areas between mid-year agents and prosecutors. However, we did not find documentary or testimonial evidence that improper considerations, including political bias, directly affected the specific investigative decisions we reviewed in Chapter 5, or that the justifications offered for these decisions were pretextual. Nonetheless, these messages cast a cloud over the FBI's handling of the mid-year investigation and the investigation's credibility. But our review did not find evidence to connect the political views expressed in these messages to the specific investigative decisions that we reviewed, rather, consistent with the analytic approach described above, we found that these specific decisions were the result of discretionary judgments made during the course of an investigation by the mid-year agents and prosecutors and that these judgment calls were not unreasonable. The broader impact of these text and instant messages, including on such matters as the public perception of the FBI and the mid-year investigation, are discussed in Chapter 12 of our report. Comey's public statement on July 5th and game discussions as we describe in Chapter 6 of the report, by the spring of 2016, Comey and the mid-year team had determined that, absent an unexpected development, evidence to support a criminal prosecution of Clinton was lacking. Mid-year team members told us that they based this assessment on a lack of evidence showing intent to place classified information on the server, or knowledge that the information was classified. We describe the factors that the department took into account in its decision to decline prosecution in Chapter 7 of our report and below. Comey told the OIG that as he began to realize the investigation was likely to result in a declination, he began to think of ways to credibly announce its closing. Comey engaged then Dag Yates in discussions in April 2016 about the endgame for the mid-year investigation. Comey said that he encouraged Yates to consider the most transparent options for announcing a declination. Yates told the OIG that, 
as a result of her four executive summary a review of various actions by the Federal Bureau of Investigation and Department of Justice in advance of the 2016 election discussions with Comey, she thought the department and FBI would jointly announce any declination. Comey said he also told Yates that the closer they got to the political conventions, the more likely he would be to insist that a special counsel be appointed because he did not believe the department could credibly announce the closing of the investigation once Clinton was the Democratic Party nominee. However, we did not find evidence that Comey ever seriously considered requesting a special counsel, instead, he used the reference to a special counsel as an effort to induce the department to move more quickly to obtain the Mills and Samuelson calling laptops and to complete the investigation. Although Comey engaged with the department in these endgame discussions, he told us that he was concerned that involvement by then A.G. Loretta Lynch in a declination announcement would result in corrosive doubt about whether the decision was objective and impartial because Lynch was appointed by a president from the same political party as Clinton. Comey cited other factors to us that he said caused him to be concerned by early May 2016 that Lynch could not credibly participate in announcing a declination an alleged instruction from Lynch at a meeting in September 2015 to call the mid-year investigation a matter in statements to the media and Congress, which we describe in Chapter 4 of our report, statements made by then-President Barack Obama about the mid-year investigation, which also are discussed in Chapter 4, and concerns that certain classified information mentioning Lynch would leak, which we describe in Chapter 6 and in the classified appendix. As we discuss below and in Chapter 6 of our report, the meeting between Lynch and former President Clinton on June 27, 2016 also played a role in Comey's decision to deliver a unilateral statement. Comey did not raise any of these concerns with Lynch or Yates. Rather, unbeknownst to them, Comey began considering the possibility of an FBI-only public statement in late April and early May 2016. Comey told the OIG that a separate public statement was warranted by the 500-year flood in which the FBI found itself, and that he weighed the need to preserve the credibility and integrity of the department and the FBI, and the need to protect a sense of justice more broadly in the country that things are fair not fixed, and they're done independently. Comey's draft statement Comey's initial draft statement, which he shared with FBI senior leadership on May 2, criticized Clinton's handling of classified information as grossly negligent, but concluded that no reasonable prosecutor would bring a case based on the facts developed in the mid-year investigation. Over the course of the next two months, Comey's draft statement underwent various language changes, including the following, the description of Clinton's handling of classified information was changed from grossly negligent to extremely careless a statement that the sheer volume of information classified as secret supported an inference of gross negligence was removed and replaced with a statement that the classified information they discovered was especially concerning because all of these emails were housed on servers not supported by full-time staff, a statement that the FBI assessed that it was reasonably likely that hostile actors gained access to Clinton's private email server was changed to possible. The statement also acknowledged that the FBI investigation and its forensic analysis did not find evidence that Clinton's email server systems were compromised, and a paragraph summarizing the factors that led the FBI to assess that it was possible that hostile actors accessed Clinton's server was added, and at one point referenced Clinton's use of her private email for an exchange with then-President Obama while in the territory of a foreign adversary. This reference later was changed to another senior government official and ultimately was omitted. Each version of the statement criticized Clinton's handling of classified information. Comey told us that he included criticism of former Secretary Clinton's uncharged conduct because unusual transparency, was necessary for an unprecedented situation, and that such transparency was the best chance we had of having the American people have confidence that the justice system works. V Executive Summary A review of various actions by the Federal Bureau of Investigation and Department of Justice in advance of the 2016 election Other witnesses told the OIG that Comey included this criticism to avoid creating the appearance that the FBI was letting Clinton off the hook, 
as well as to Mesagi the decision to the FBI workforce to emphasize that employees would be disciplined for similar conduct and to distinguish the Clinton investigation from the cases of other public figures who had been prosecuted for mishandling violations. The tarmac meeting and impact on Comey's statement on June 27, 2016, Lynch met with former President Clinton on Lynch's plane, which was parked on the tarmac at a Phoenix airport. This meeting was unplanned, and Lynch's staff told the OIG they received no notice that former President Clinton planned to board Lynch's plane. Both Lynch and former President Clinton told the OIG that they did not discuss the mid-year investigation or any other department investigation during their conversation. Chapter 6 of our report describes their testimony about the substance of their discussion. Lynch told the OIG that she became increasingly concerned as the meeting went on and on, and stated that it was just too long a conversation to have had. Following this meeting, Lynch obtained an ethics opinion from the Departmental Ethics Office that she was not required to recuse herself from the mid-year investigation, and she decided not to voluntarily recuse herself either. In making this decision, Lynch told the OIG that stepping aside would create a misimpression that she and former President Clinton had discussed inappropriate topics, or that her role in the mid-year investigation somehow was greater than it was. On July 1, during an interview with a reporter, Lynch stated that she was not recusing from the mid-year investigation, but that she fully expected Ed to accept the recommendation of the career agents and prosecutors who conducted the investigation, as is the common process. Then, in a follow-up question, Lynch said I'll be briefed on the findings and I will be accepting their recommendations. Lynch's statements created considerable public confusion about the status of her continuing involvement in the mid-year investigation. Although we found no evidence that Lynch and former President Clinton discussed the mid-year investigation or engaged in other inappropriate discussion during their tarmac meeting, we also found that Lynch's failure to recognize the appearance problem created by former President Clinton's visit and to take action to cut the visit short was an error in judgment. We further concluded that her efforts to respond to the meeting by explaining what her role would be in the investigation going forward created public confusion and did not adequately address the situation. Comey told the OIG that he was 90% there, like highly likely to make a separate public statement prior to the tarmac meeting, but that the tarmac meeting tipped the scales toward making his mind up to go forward with his own public statement. Comey's decision not to tell department leadership Comey acknowledged that he made a conscious decision not to tell department leadership about his plans to make a separate statement because he was concerned that they would instruct him not to do it. He also acknowledged that he made this decision when he first conceived of the idea to do the statement, even as he continued to engage the department in discussions about the end game for the investigation. Comey admitted that he concealed his intentions from the department until the morning of his press conference on July 5, and instructed his staff to do the same, to make it impracticable for department leadership to prevent him from delivering his statement. We found that it was extraordinary and insubordinate for Comey to do so and we found none of his reasons to be a persuasive basis for deviating from well-established department policies in a way intentionally designed to avoid supervision by department leadership over his actions. On the morning of July 5, 2016, Comey contacted Lynch and Yates about his plans to make a public statement, but did so only after the FBI had notified the press in fact, the department first learned about Comey's press conference from a media inquiry, rather than from the FBI. When Comey did call Lynch that morning, he told her that he was not going to inform her about the substance of his planned press statement. While Lynch asked Comey what the subject matter of the statement was going to be, Comey told her in response it would be about the mid-year investigation, she did not ask him to tell her what he intended to say about the mid-year investigation. We found that Lynch, having decided not to recuse herself, retained authority over both the final prosecution decision and the department's management of the mid-year investigation. As such, we believe she should have instructed Comey 6 Executive Summary a review of various actions by the Federal Bureau of Investigation and Department of Justice in advance of the 2016 election to tell her what he intended to say beforehand, and should have discussed it with Comey. Comey's public statement announced that the FBI had completed its mid-year investigation, criticized Clinton and her senior aides as extremely careless in their handling of classified information, 
stated that the FBI was recommending that the department decline prosecution of Clinton, and asserted that no reasonable prosecutor would prosecute Clinton based on the facts developed by the FBI during its investigation. We determined that Comey's decision to make this statement was the result of his belief that only he had the ability to credibly and authoritatively convey the rationale for the decision to not seek charges against Clinton, and that he needed to hold the press conference to protect the FBI and the department from the extraordinary harm that he believed would have resulted had he failed to do so. While we found no evidence that Comey's statement was the result of bias or an effort to influence the election, we did not find his justifications for issuing the statement to be reasonable or persuasive. We concluded that Comey's unilateral announcement was inconsistent with department policy and violated long-standing department practice and protocol by, among other things, criticizing Clinton's uncharged conduct. We also found that Comey usurped the authority of the Attorney General, and inadequately and incompletely described the legal position of department prosecutors. The department's declination decision on July 6 following Comey's public statement on July 5, the mid-year prosecutors finalized their recommendation that the department decline prosecution of Clinton, her senior aides, and the senders of emails determined to contain classified information. On July 6, the mid-year prosecutors briefed Lynch, Yates, Comey, other members of department and FBI leadership, and FBI mid-year team members about the basis for the declination recommendation. Lynch subsequently issued a short public statement that she met with the career prosecutors and agents who conducted the investigation and received and accepted their unanimous recommendation that the investigation be closed without charges. We found that the prosecutors considered five federal statutes, 18 U.S.C. 793, D, and E willful mishandling of documents or information relating to the national defense, 18 U.S.C. 793, F, removal, loss, theft, abstraction, or destruction of documents or information relating to the national defense through gross negligence, or failure to report such removal, loss, theft, abstraction, or destruction, 18 U.S.C. 1924, unauthorized removal and retention of classified documents or material by government employees, and 18 U.S.C. 2071, concealment, removal, or mutilation of government records. As described in Chapter 7 of our report, the prosecutors concluded that the evidence did not support prosecution under any of these statutes for various reasons, including that former Secretary Clinton and her senior aides lacked the intent to communicate classified information on unclassified systems. Critical to their conclusion was that the emails in question lacked proper classification markings, that the senders often refrained from using specific classified facts or terms in emails and worded emails carefully in an attempt to talk around classified information, that the emails were sent to other government officials in furtherance of their official duties, and that former Secretary Clinton relied on the judgment of State Department employees to properly handle classified information. Among other facts. We further found that the statute that required the most complex analysis by the prosecutors was Section 793, F, 1, the gross negligence provision that has been the focus of much of the criticism of the declination decision. As we describe in Chapters 2 and 7 of our report, the prosecutors analyzed the legislative history of Section 793, F, 1, relevant case law, and the department's prior interpretation of the statute. They concluded that Section 793, F, 1, likely required a state of mind that was so gross as to almost suggest deliberate intention, criminally reckless, or something that falls just short of being willful, as well as evidence that the individuals who sent emails containing classified information knowingly included or transferred such information onto unclassified systems. The mid-year team concluded that such proof was lacking. We found that this interpretation of Section 793, F, 1, was consistent with the Department's historical approach in prior cases under different leadership, including in the 2008 decision not to 7 Executive Summary A review of various actions by the Federal Bureau of Investigation and Department of Justice in advance of the 2016 election prosecute former Attorney General Alberto Gonzalez for mishandling classified documents. 
we analyzed the department's declination decision according to the same analytical standard that we applied to other decisions made during the investigation. We did not substitute the OIG's judgment for the judgments made by the department, but rather sought to determine whether the decision was based on improper considerations, including political bias. We found no evidence that the conclusions by the prosecutors were affected by bias or other improper considerations, rather, we determined that they were based on the prosecutor's assessment of the facts, the law, and past department practice. We therefore concluded that these were legal and policy judgments involving core prosecutorial discretion that were for the department to make. Discovery in September 2016 of emails on the Wiener Laptop Discovery of emails by the FBI's New York Field Office in September 2016, the FBI's New York Field Office, NIO, and the U.S. Attorney's Office for the Southern District of New York, SDNY began investigating former Congressman Anthony Weiner for his online relationship with a minor. A federal search warrant was obtained on September 26, 2016, for Weiner's iPhone, iPad, and laptop computer. The FBI obtained these devices the same day. The search warrant authorized the government to search for evidence relating to the following crimes, transmitting obscene material to a minor, sexual exploitation of children, and activities related to child pornography. The Wiener case agent told the OIG that he began processing Wiener's devices on September 26, and that he noticed within hours that there were over 300,000 emails on the laptop. He said that either that evening or the next morning, he saw at least one BlackBerry pin message between Clinton and Abedin, as well as emails between them. He said that he recalled seeing emails associated with about seven domains such as yahoo.com, state.gov, clintonfoundation.org, clintonemail.com, and hillaryclinton.com. The case agent immediately notified his NEO chain of command, and the information was ultimately briefed to NEO assistant director in charge, ADIC, William Sweeney on September 28. Reporting of emails to FBI headquarters as we describe in Chapter 9 of our report. Sweeney took the following steps to notify FBI headquarters about the discovery of mid-year related emails on the Wiener laptop, on September 28, during a secure video teleconference, SVTC, Sweeney reported that Wiener investigation agents had discovered 141,000 emails on Wiener's laptop that were potentially relevant to the mid-year investigation. The OIG determined that this SVTC was led by then-Deputy Director Andrew McCabe, and that approximately 39 senior FBI executives likely would have participated. Comey was not present for the SVTC. Sweeney said he spoke again with McCabe on the evening of September 28. Sweeney said that during this call he informed McCabe that Neil personnel had continued processing the laptop and that they had now identified 347,000 emails on the laptop. Sweeney said he also called two FBI executive assistant directors, EAD, on September 28 and informed them that the Wiener case team had discovered emails relevant to the mid-year investigation. One of the EADs told the OIG that he then called McCabe, and that McCabe told the EAD that he was aware of the emails. The EAD told us that T here was no doubt in my mind when we finished that conversation that McCabe understood the the gravity of what the find was. Sweeney said he also spoke to FBI Assistant Director E.W. Bill Priestup on September 28 and 29, 2016. Emails indicate that during their conversation on September 29, they discussed the limited scope of the Wiener search warrant, i.e., the need to obtain additional legal process to review any mid-year related email on the Wiener laptop. Initial response of FBI headquarters McCabe told the OIG that he considered the information provided by Sweeney to be a big deal and said he instructed Priestup to send a team to New York to review the emails on the Wiener laptop. McCabe told the OIG that he recalled talking to Comey about the issue right around the time McCabe found out about it. McCabe described it as a flyby, where the Wiener 8 executive summary a review of various actions by the Federal Bureau of Investigation and Department of Justice in advance of the 2016 election laptop was like one in a list of things that we discussed. Comey said that he recalled first learning about the additional emails on the Wiener laptop at some point in early October 2016, 
although he said it was possible this could have occurred in late September 2016. Comey told the OIG that this information didn't index with him, which he attributed to the way the information was presented to him and the fact that, I don't know that I knew that Wiener was married to Huma Abedin at the time. Text messages of FBI Deputy Assistant Director Peter Strzok indicated that he, McCabe, and Priestup discussed the Wiener laptop on September 28. Strzok said that he had initially planned to send a team to New York to review the emails, but a conference call with Neil was scheduled instead. The conference call took place on September 29, and five members of the FBI mid-year team participated. Notes from the conference call indicate the participants discussed the presence of a large volume of emails, 350,000, on the Wiener laptop and specific domain names, including clintonemail.com and state.gov. The mid-year SSA said that Neo also mentioned seeing BlackBerry domain emails on the Wiener laptop. Additional discussions took place on October 3 and 4, 2016. However, after October 4, we found no evidence that anyone associated with the mid-year investigation, including the entire leadership team at FBI headquarters, took any action on the Wiener laptop issue until the week of October 24, and then did so only after the Wiener case agent expressed concerns to SDNY, prompting SDNY to contact the Office of the Deputy Attorney General, ODAG, on October 21 to raise concerns about the lack of action. Re-engagement of FBI headquarters on Friday, October 21, SDNY Deputy U.S. Attorney June Kim contacted ODAG and was put in touch with Dog George Tosquez, the most senior career department official involved in the mid-year investigation. Thereafter, at Tosquez's request, one of the mid-year prosecutors called Strzok. This was the first conversation that the FBI had with mid-year prosecutors about the Wiener laptop. Toscas said he asked McCabe about the Wiener laptop on Monday, October 24, after a routine meeting between FBI and department leadership. McCabe told us that this interaction with Toscas caused him to follow up with the FBI mid-year team about the Wiener laptop and to call McCord about the issue. On October 26, NEO, SDNY, and mid-year team members participated in a conference call. The FBI mid-year team told the OIG that they learned important new information on this call, specifically, 1, that there was a large volume of emails on the Wiener laptop, particularly the potential for a large number of at clintonemail.com emails, and, 2, that the presence of BlackBerry data indicated that emails from Clinton's first three months as Secretary of State could be present on the laptop. However, as we describe above and in Chapter 9 of our report, these basic facts were known to the FBI by September 29, 2016. The FBI mid-year team briefed McCabe about the information from the conference call on the evening of October 26, 2016. McCabe told us that he felt the situation was absolutely urgent and proposed that the FBI mid-year team meet with Comey the following day. On October 27 at 5.20 a.m., McCabe emailed Comey stating that the mid-year team has come across some additional actions they believe they need to take, and recommending that they meet that day to discuss the implications if you have any space on your calendar. Comey stated that he did not know what this email was about when he received it and did not initially recall that he had been previously notified about the Wiener laptop. We found that, by no later than September 29, FBI executives and the FBI mid-year team had learned virtually every fact that was cited by the FBI in late October as justification for obtaining the search warrant for the Wiener laptop, including that the laptop contained over 340,000 emails, some of which were from domains associated with Clinton, including state.gov, clintonfoundation.org, clintonemail.com, and hillaryclinton.com numerous emails between Clinton and Abedin, an unknown number of BlackBerry communications on the laptop, including one or more messages between Clinton and Abedin, indicating the possibility that the laptop contained communications from the early months of Clinton's tenure, and emails dated beginning in 2007 and covering the entire period of Clinton's tenure as Secretary of State. 
9 Executive Summary A review of various actions by the Federal Bureau of Investigation and Department of Justice in advance of the 2016 election as we describe in Chapter 9 of our report, the explanations we were given for the FBI's failure to take immediate action on the Wiener laptop fell into four general categories, the FBI mid-year team was waiting for additional information about the contents of the laptop from NEO, which was not provided until late October, the FBI mid-year team could not review the emails without additional legal authority, such as consent or a new search warrant, the FBI mid-year team and senior FBI officials did not believe that the information on the laptop was likely to be significant, and key members of the FBI mid-year team had been reassigned to the investigation of Russian interference in the U.S. election, which was a higher priority. We found these explanations to be unpersuasive justifications for not acting sooner, Given the FBI leadership's conclusion about the importance of the information and that the FBI mid-year team had sufficient information to take action in early October and knew at that time that it would need a new search warrant to review any Clinton abetting emails. Moreover, given the FBI's extensive resources, the fact that Strzok and several other FBI members of the mid-year team had been assigned to the Russia investigation, which was extremely active during this September and October time period was not an excuse for failing to take any action during this time period on the Wiener laptop. The FBI's failure to act in late September or early October is even less justifiable when contrasted with the attention and resources that FBI management and some members of the mid-year team dedicated to other activities in connection with the mid-year investigation during the same period. As detailed in Chapter 8, these activities included the preparation of Comey's speech at the FBI's SAC conference on October 12, a speech designed to help equip SACs to bat down misinformation about the July 5 declination decision, the preparation and distribution of detailed talking points to FBI SACs in mid-October in order, again, to equip people who are going to be talking about it anyway with the actual facts and the FBI's actual perspective on the declination, and a Briefing for retired FBI agents conducted on October 21st to describe the investigative decisions made during mid-year so as to arm former employees with facts so that they, too, might counter falsehoods and exaggerations. In assessing the decision to prioritize the Russia investigation over following up on the mid-year related investigative lead discovered on the Wiener laptop, we were particularly concerned about text messages sent by Strzok and Page that potentially indicated or created the appearance that investigative decisions they made were impacted by bias or improper considerations. Most of the text messages raising such questions pertain to the Russia investigation, and the implication in some of these text messages, particularly Strzok's August 8 text message, will stop candidate Trump from being elected was that Strzok might be willing to take official action to impact a presidential candidate's electoral prospects. Under these circumstances, we did not have confidence that Strzok's decision to prioritize the Russia investigation over following up on the mid-year related investigative lead discovered on the Wiener laptop was free from bias. We searched for evidence that the Wiener laptop was deliberately placed on the back burner by others in the FBI to protect Clinton but found no evidence in emails, text messages, instant messages, or documents that suggested an improper purpose. We also took note of the fact that numerous other FBI executives including the approximately 39 who participated in the September 28 SVTC were briefed on the potential existence of mid-year related emails on the Wiener laptop. We also noted that the Russia investigation was under the supervision of Priestop for whom we found no evidence of bias and who himself was aware of the Wiener laptop issue by September 29. However, we also did not identify a consistent or persuasive explanation for the FBI's failure to act for almost a month after learning of potential mid-year related emails on the Wiener laptop. The FBI's inaction had potentially far-reaching consequences. Comey told the OIG that, had he known about the laptop in the beginning of October and thought the email review could have been completed before the election, it may have affected his decision to notify Congress. Comey told the OIG, I don't know if it would have put us in a different place, 
but I would have wanted to have the opportunity x executive summary a review of various actions by the Federal Bureau of Investigation and Department of Justice in advance of the 2016 election Comey's decision to notify Congress on October 28 following the briefing from the FBI mid-year team on October 27, 2016, Comey authorized the mid-year team to seek a search warrant, telling the OIG that the volume of emails and the presence of BlackBerry emails on the Wiener laptop were two highly significant facts. As we describe in Chapter 13 of our report, McCabe joined this meeting by phone but was asked not to participate, and subsequently recused himself from the mid-year investigation on November 1, 2016. The issue of notifying Congress of the Wiener laptop development was first raised at the October 27 briefing and, over the course of the next 24 hours, Numerous additional discussions occurred within the FBI. As we describe in Chapter 10 of our report, the factors considered during those discussions included, Comey's belief that failure to disclose the existence of the emails would be an act of concealment, the belief that Comey had an obligation to update Congress because the discovery was potentially significant and made his prior testimony that the investigation was closed no longer true, an implicit assumption that Clinton would be elected president, fear that the information would leak. If the FBI failed to disclose it, concern that failing to disclose would result in accusations that the FBI had engineered a cover-up to help Clinton get elected, concerns about protecting the reputation of the FBI, concerns about the perceived illegitimacy of a Clinton presidency that would follow from a failure to disclose the discovery of the emails if they proved to be significant, concerns about the electoral impact of any announcement, and the belief that the email review could not be completed before the election. As a result of these discussions on October 27, Comey decided to notify Congress about the discovery of mid-year related emails on the Wiener laptop. Comey told us that, although he believed he very strongly that our rule should be, we don't comment on pending investigations and that it was a very important norm for the department to avoid taking actions that could impact an imminent election he felt he had an obligation to update Congress because the email discovery was potentially very significant and it made his prior testimony no longer true. We found no evidence that Comey's decision to send the October 28 letter was influenced by political preferences. Instead, we found that his decision was the result of several interrelated factors that were connected to his concern that failing to send the letter would harm the FBI and his ability to lead it and his view that candidate Clinton was going to win the presidency and that she would be perceived to be an illegitimate president if the public first learned of the information after the election. Although Comey told us that he didn't make this decision because he thought it would leak otherwise, several FBI officials told us that the concern about leaks played a role in the decision. Much like with his July 5 announcement, we found that in making this decision, Comey engaged in ad hoc decision-making based on his personal views even if it meant rejecting long-standing department policy or practice. We found unpersuasive Comey's explanation as to why transparency was more important than department policy and practice with regard to the reactivated mid-year investigation while, by contrast, department policy and practice were more important to follow with regard to the Clinton Foundation and Russia investigations. Comey's description of his choice as being between two doors, one labeled speak and one labeled conceal, was a false dichotomy. The two doors were actually labeled follow policy slash practice and depart from policy slash practice. Although we acknowledge that Comey faced a difficult situation with unattractive choices, in proceeding as he did, we concluded that Comey made a serious error of judgment. Department and FBI leadership discussions on October 27. Comey instructed his chief of staff, James Rybicki, to reach out to the department about his plan to notify Congress. As we describe in Chapter 10 of our report, Comey told the OIG that he decided to ask Rybicki to inform the department rather than to contact Lynch or Yates directly because he did not want to jam them and I wanted to offer them the 11 executive summary a review of various actions by the Federal Bureau of Investigation and Department of Justice in advance of the 2016 election opportunity to think about and decide whether they wanted to be engaged on it. Rybicki and Axelrod spoke on the afternoon of October 27 and had a series of phone calls the rest of the day. 
Rybicki told Axelrod that Comey believed he had an obligation to notify Congress about the laptop in order to correct a misimpression that the mid-year investigation was closed. Lynch, Yates, Axelrod and their staffs had several discussions that same day as to whether Lynch or Yates should call Comey directly, but said they ultimately decided to have Axelrod communicate the strong view that neither the DAG nor AG felt this letter should go out. Yates told us they were concerned that direct contact with Comey would be perceived as strong-arming him, and that based on her experience with Comey, he was likely to push back hard against input from Lynch or her, especially if accepting their input meant that he had to go back to his staff and explain that he was reversing his decision. She said that she viewed Rybicki as the person they needed to convince if they wanted to change Comey's mind. Accordingly, Axelrod informed Rybicki on October 27 of the department's strong opposition to Comey's plan to send a letter. Rybicki reported to Comey that the department recommended Ed against the congressional notification and thought it was a bad idea. Although Comey told us that he would not have sent the letter if Lynch or Yates had told him not to do so, he said he viewed their response as only a recommendation and interpreted their lack of direct engagement as saying basically, it's up to you. I honestly thought they were taking kind of a cowardly way out. The following day, October 28, Comey sent a letter to Congress stating, in part, that the FBI has learned of the existence of emails that appear to be pertinent to the mid-year investigation. Comey, Lynch and Yates faced difficult choices in late October 2016. However, we found it extraordinary that Comey assessed that it was best that the FBI director not speak directly with the Attorney General and Deputy Attorney General about how best to navigate this most important decision and mitigate the resulting harms, and that Comey's decision resulted in the Attorney General and Deputy Attorney General concluding that it would be counterproductive to speak directly with the FBI director. We believe that open and candid communication among leaders in the department and its components is essential for the effective functioning of the department. Text and instant messages, use of personal email, and alleged improper disclosures of non-public information text messages and instant messages as we describe in Chapter 12, during our review we identified text messages and instant messages sent on FBI mobile devices or computer systems by five FBI employees who were assigned to the mid-year investigation. These included, text messages exchanged between Strzok and Page, instant messages exchanged between Agent 1, who was one of the four mid-year case agents, and Agent 5, who was a member of the filter team, and instant messages sent by FBI Attorney 2, who was assigned to the mid-year investigation. The text messages and instant messages sent by these employees included statements of hostility toward then-candidate Trump and statements of support for candidate Clinton, and several appeared to mix political opinions with discussions about the mid-year investigation. We found that the conduct of these five FBI employees brought discredit to themselves, sowed doubt about the FBI's handling of the mid-year investigation, and impacted the reputation of the FBI. Although our review did not find documentary or testimonial evidence directly connecting the political views these employees expressed in their text messages and instant messages to the specific investigative decisions we reviewed in Chapter 5, the conduct by these employees cast a cloud over the FBI mid-year investigation and so doubt the FBI's work on, and its handling of, the mid-year investigation. Moreover, the damage caused by their actions extends far beyond the scope of the mid-year investigation and goes to the heart of the FBI's reputation for neutral fact-finding and political independence. We were deeply troubled by text messages exchanged between Strzok and Page that potentially indicated or created the appearance that investigative decisions were impacted by bias or improper considerations. Most of the text messages raising such questions pertain to the Russia investigation, which was not a part of this review. Nonetheless, when one senior FBI official, Strzok, who was helping to lead the Russia 12 executive summary a review of various actions by the Federal Bureau of Investigation and Department of Justice in advance of the 2016 election investigation at the time, conveys in a text message to another senior FBI official, Page, no. No he won't. We'll stop it in response to her question Trump's not ever going to become president, right? Right, it is not only indicative of a biased state of mind but, even more seriously, 
implies a willingness to take official action to impact the presidential candidate's electoral prospects. This is antithetical to the core values of the FBI and the Department of Justice. We do not question that the FBI employees who sent these messages are entitled to their own political views. However, we believe using FBI devices to send the messages discussed in Chapter 12 particularly the messages that intermix work-related discussions with political commentary potentially implicate provisions in the FBI's offense code and penalty guidelines. At a minimum, we found that the employees' use of FBI systems and devices to send the identified messages demonstrated extremely poor judgment and a gross lack of professionalism. We therefore refer this information to the FBI for its handling and consideration of whether the messages sent by the five employees listed above violated the FBI's offense code of conduct. Use of personal email as we also describe in Chapter 12, we learned during the course of our review that Comey, Struzik and Page used their personal email accounts to conduct FBI business. We identified numerous instances in which Comey used a personal email account to conduct unclassified FBI business. We found that, given the absence of exigent circumstances and the frequency with which the use of personal email occurred, Comey's use of a personal email account for unclassified FBI business to be inconsistent with department policy. We found that Strzok used his personal email accounts for official government business on several occasions, including forwarding an email from his FBI account to his personal email account about the proposed search warrant the mid-year team was seeking on the Wiener laptop. This email included a draft of the search warrant affidavit, which contained information from the Wiener investigation that appears to have been under seal at the time in the Southern District of New York and information obtained pursuant to a grand jury subpoena issued in the Eastern District of Virginia in the mid-year investigation. We refer to the FBI the issue of whether Strzok's use of personal email accounts violated FBI and department policies. Finally, when questioned, Page also told us she used personal email for work-related matters at times. She stated that she and Strzok sometimes used these forums for work-related discussions due to the technical limitations of FBI-issued phones. Page left the FBI on May 4, 2018. Improper disclosure of non-public information as we also describe in Chapter 12, among the issues we reviewed were allegations that department and FBI employees improperly disclosed non-public information regarding the mid-year investigation. Although FBI policy strictly limits the employees who are authorized to speak to the media, we found that this policy appeared to be widely ignored during the period we reviewed. We identified numerous FBI employees at all levels of the organization and with no official reason to be in contact with the media, who were nevertheless in frequent contact with reporters. Attached to this report as attachments E and F are two link charts that reflect the volume of communications that we identified between FBI employees and media representatives in April-May and October 2016. We have profound concerns about the volume and extent of unauthorized media contacts by FBI personnel that we have uncovered during our review. In addition, we identified instances where FBI employees improperly received benefits from reporters, including tickets to sporting events, golfing outings, drinks, and meals, and admittance to non-public social events. We will separately report on those investigations as they are concluded, consistent with the Inspector General Act other applicable federal statutes, and OIG policy. The harm caused by leaks, fear of potential leaks, and a culture of unauthorized media contacts is illustrated in Chapters 10 and 11 of our report, where we detail the fact that these issues influenced FBI officials who were advising Comey on consequential investigative decisions in October 2016. The FBI updated its media policy in November 2017, restating its strict guidelines concerning media contacts, and identifying who is required to obtain authority before engaging members of the media, and when and where to report media contact. We do not believe the problem is with the FBI's policy, which we found to be clear and unambiguous. Rather, we concluded that these leaks highlight the need to change what appears to be a cultural attitude among many in the organization. 13 Executive Summary A review of various actions by the Federal Bureau of Investigation and Department of Justice in advance of the 2016 election recusal issues Former Deputy Director Andrew McCabe, 
as we describe in Chapter 13 in 2015, McCabe's spouse, Dr. Jill McCabe, ran for a Virginia State Senate seat. During the campaign, Dr. McCabe's campaign committee received substantial monetary and in-kind contributions totaling $675,288 or approximately 40% of the total contributions raised by Dr. McCabe for her state senate campaign, from then-Governor McAuliffe's Political Action Committee PAC, and from the Virginia Democratic Party. In addition, on June 26, 2015, Hillary Clinton was the featured speaker at a fundraiser in Virginia hosted by the Virginia Democratic Party and attended by Governor McAuliffe. At the time his wife sought to run for state senate, McCabe was the assistant director in charge of the FBI's Washington Field Office, WFO, and sought ethics advice from FBI ethics officials and attorneys. We found that FBI ethics officials and attorneys did not fully appreciate the potential significant implications to McCabe and the FBI from campaign donations to Dr. McCabe's campaign. The FBI did not implement any review of campaign donations to assess potential conflicts or appearance issues that could arise from the donations. On this issue, we believe McCabe did what he was supposed to do by notifying those responsible in the FBI for ethics issues and seeking their guidance. After McCabe became FBI Deputy Director in February 2016, McCabe had an active role in the supervision of the mid-year investigation, and oversight of the Clinton Foundation investigation, until he recused himself from these investigations on November 1, 2016. McCabe voluntarily recused himself on November 1, at Comey's urging as the result of an October 23 article in the Wall Street Journal identifying the substantial donations from McAuliffe's PAC and the Virginia Democratic Party to Dr. McCabe. With respect to these investigations, we agreed with the FBI's chief ethics official that McCabe was not at any time required to recuse under the relevant authorities. However, voluntary recusal is always permissible with the approval of a supervisor or ethics official, which is what McCabe did on November 1. Had the FBI put in place a system for reviewing campaign donations to Dr. McCabe, which were public under Virginia law, the sizable donations from McAuliffe's PAC and the Virginia Democratic Party may have triggered prior consideration of the very appearance concerns raised in the October 23 WSJ article. Finally, we also found that McCabe did not fully comply with this recusal in a few instances related to the Clinton Foundation investigation. Former Assistant Attorney General Peter Kadzik, in Chapter 14, we found that Kadzik demonstrated poor judgment by failing to recuse himself from Clinton-related matters under federal ethics regulations prior to November 2, 2016. Kadzik did not recognize the appearance of a conflict that he created when he initiated an effort to obtain employment for his son with the Clinton campaign while participating in department discussions and communications about Clinton-related matters. Kadzik also created an appearance of a conflict when he sent the chairman of the Clinton campaign and a longtime friend, John Podesta, the heads-up email that included the schedule for the release of former Secretary Clinton's emails proposed to the court in a FOIA litigation without knowing whether the information had yet been filed and made public. His willingness to do so raised a reasonable question about his ability to act impartially on Clinton-related matters in connection with his official duties. Additionally, Although department leadership determined that Kadzik should be recused from Clinton-related matters upon learning of his heads-up email to Podesta, we found that Kadzik failed to strictly adhere to this recusal. Lastly, because the government information in the heads-up email had in fact been released publicly, we did not find that Kadzik released non-public information or misused his official position. FBI Records Vault Twitter announcements as we describe in Chapter 15 on November 1, 2016, in response to multiple FOIA requests, the FBI Records Management Division, RMD, posted records to the FBI Records Vault, a page on the FBI's public website, concerning the William J. Clinton Foundation. The FBI Records Vault Twitter account announced this posting later the same day. We concluded that these requests were processed according to RMD's internal procedures like other similarly sized requests, and found no evidence that the FOIA response was expedited or delayed in order to impact the 2016 presidential election. 
We also found no evidence that improper political considerations influenced the FBI's use of the Twitter account to publicize the release. 14 Executive Summary A review of various actions by the Federal Bureau of Investigation and Department of Justice in advance of the 2016 election recommendations Our report makes nine recommendations to the department and the FBI to assist them in addressing the issues that we identified in this review. We recommend that the department and the FBI consider developing guidance that identifies the risks associated with and alternatives to permitting a witness to attend a voluntary interview of another witness, including in the witness's capacity as counsel. We recommend that the department consider making explicit that, except in situations where the law requires or permits disclosure, an investigating agency cannot publicly announce its recommended charging decision prior to consulting with the Attorney General. Deputy Attorney General, U.S. Attorney, or his or her designee, and cannot proceed without the approval of one of these officials. We recommend that the Department and the FBI consider adopting a policy addressing the appropriateness of Department employees discussing the conduct of uncharged individuals in public statements. We recommend that the Department consider providing guidance to agents and prosecutors concerning the taking of overt investigative steps, indictments, public announcements, or other actions that could impact an election. We recommend that the Office of the Deputy Attorney General take steps to improve the retention and monitoring of text messages department-wide. We recommend that the FBI add a warning banner to all of the FBI's mobile phones and devices in order to further notify users that they have no reasonable expectation of privacy. We recommend that the FBI consider, a, assessing whether it has provided adequate training to employees about the proper use of text messages and instant messages, including any related discovery obligations, and, b, providing additional guidance about the allowable uses of FBI devices for any non-governmental purpose, including guidance about the use of FBI devices for political conversations. We recommend that the FBI consider whether, a, it is appropriately educating employees about both its media contact policy and the department's ethics rules pertaining to the acceptance of gifts, and, b, its disciplinary provisions and penalties are sufficient to deter such improper conduct. We recommend that department ethics officials include the review of campaign donations for possible conflict issues when department employees or their spouses run for public office. Page left intentionally blank 1 Chapter 1, Introduction I Background The Department of Justice, Department, Office of the Inspector General, OIG, undertook this review of various actions by the Federal Bureau of Investigation, FBI and department in connection with the investigation into the use of a private email server by former Secretary of State Hillary Clinton. Clinton served as Secretary of State from January 21, 2009, until February 1, 2013, and during that time used private email servers hosting the at clintonemail.com domain to conduct official Department of State, State Department, business. In 2014, in response to a request from the State Department to Clinton for copies of any federal records in her possession, such as emails sent or received on a personal email account while serving as Secretary of State, Clinton produced to the State Department 30,490 emails from her private server that her attorneys determined were work-related. Clinton and her attorneys did not produce to the State Department approximately 31,830 emails because, they stated, they were personal in nature, and these emails subsequently were deleted from the laptop computers that the attorneys used to review them. In 2015, at the State Department's request, the Office of the Inspector General of the Intelligence Community, ICIG, reviewed emails from Clinton's private email server that she had produced to the State Department and identified a potential compromise of classified information. The ICIG subsequently referred this information to the FBI. The FBI opened an investigation, known as Midyear Exam, MYE or Midyear, into the storage and transmission of classified information on Clinton's unclassified private servers in July 2015. Over the course of the next year, FBI agents and analysts and department prosecutors conducted the investigation. Their activities included obtaining and analyzing servers and devices used by Clinton, contents of private email accounts for certain senior aides and computers and email accounts used to back up, process, 
or transfer Clinton's emails. The investigative team interviewed numerous witnesses, including current and former State Department employees. On June 27, 2016, while the mid-year investigation was nearing completion, then-Attorney General, A.G., Loretta Lynch and former President Bill Clinton had an unscheduled meeting while their planes were parked on the tarmac at Phoenix's Sky Harbor Airport. Former President Clinton boarded Lynch's plane, and Lynch, Lynch's husband, and the former president met for approximately 20 to 30 minutes. Following the meeting, Lynch publicly denied having any conversation about the mid-year investigation or any other substantive matter pending before the department. Nevertheless, the meeting created significant controversy. On July 1, 2016, Lynch publicly announced that she would accept the recommendation of the two mid-year investigative and prosecutorial team regarding whether to charge former Secretary Clinton. The following day, Saturday, July 2, 2016, the FBI and department prosecutors interviewed former Secretary Clinton at the FBI's headquarters building. Then, on July 5, 2016, without coordinating with the department and with very brief notice to it, then FBI Director James Comey publicly delivered a statement that criticized Clinton, characterized her and her senior aides as extremely careless in their handling of classified information, and asserted that it was possible hostile actors gained access to Clinton's personal email account. Comey concluded, however, that the investigation should be closed because no reasonable prosecutor would prosecute Clinton or others citing the strength of the evidence and the lack of precedent for bringing a case on these facts. The following day, July 6, 2016, Lynch was briefed by the prosecutors and formally accepted their recommendation to decline prosecution. On October 28, 2016, 11 days before the presidential election, Comey sent a letter to Congress announcing the discovery of emails that appear to be pertinent to the mid-year investigation. Comey's letter was referring to the FBI's discovery of a large quantity of emails during the search of a laptop computer obtained in an unrelated investigation of Anthony Weiner, the husband of Clinton's former deputy chief of staff and personal assistant, Huma Obedin. The FBI obtained a search warrant to review the emails two days later, on October 30, 2016. Over the next six days, the FBI processed and reviewed a large volume of emails. On November 6, 2016, two days before the election, Comey sent a second letter to Congress stating that the review of the emails on the laptop had not changed the FBI's earlier conclusions with respect to Clinton. The OIG initiated this review on January 12, 2017, in response to requests from numerous chairmen and ranking members of congressional oversight committees, various organizations, and members of the public to investigate various decisions made in the mid-year investigation. The OIG announced that it would review the following issues, allegations that department or FBI policies or procedures were not followed in connection with, or in actions leading up to or related to, Comey's public announcement on July 5, 2016 and Comey's letters to Congress on October 28 and November 6, 2016, and that certain underlying investigative decisions were based on improper considerations, allegations that then-FBI Deputy Director Andrew McCabe should have been recused from participating in certain investigative matters, allegations that then-Assistant Attorney General for the Department's Office of Legislative Affairs, Peter Kadzik, improperly disclosed non-public information to the Clinton campaign and slash or should have been recused from participating in certain matters, three allegations that department and FBI employees improperly disclosed non-public information, and allegations that decisions regarding the timing of the FBI's release of certain Freedom of Information Act, FOIA, documents on October 30th and November 1st, 2016, and the use of a Twitter account to publicize the same were influenced by improper considerations. The OIG announcement added that if circumstances warrant, the OIG will consider including other issues that may arise during the course of the review. One such issue that the OIG added to the scope of this review arose from the discovery of text messages and instant messages between some FBI employees on the investigative team, conducted using FBI mobile devices and computers, 
that expressed statements of hostility toward then-candidate Donald Trump and statements of support for then-candidate Clinton, as well as comments about the handling of the mid-year investigation. We addressed whether these communications evidencing a potential bias affected investigative decisions in the mid-year investigation. This review is separate from the review the OIG announced on March 28, 2018, concerning the Department's and FBI's compliance with legal requirements, and with applicable Department and FBI policies and procedures, in applications filed with the U.S. Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Court, FISC, relating to a certain U.S. person. We will issue a separate report relating to those issues when our investigative work is complete at a future date. Two methodology during the course of this investigation, the OIG interviewed more than 100 witnesses, several on more than one occasion. These included former Director Comey, former A.G. Lynch, former Deputy Attorney General, DAG, Sally Yates, members of the former AGs and DOGS staffs, FBI agents and supervisors and department attorneys and supervisors who conducted the mid-year investigation, personnel from the FBI's New York field office, NEO, and the U.S. Attorney's Office for the Southern District of New York, SDNY, involved in the Anthony Weiner investigation, former and current members of the FBI's senior executive leadership, and former President Clinton. All of the former department and FBI officials we contacted to request interviews related to the mid-year investigation agreed to be interviewed. However, two witnesses with whom we requested interviews in connection with our review of whether Peter Kadzik, the former Assistant Attorney General for the Department's Office of Legislative Affairs, OLA, should have been recused from certain matters declined our request for an interview or were unable to schedule an interview. We also reviewed significantly more than 1.2 million documents. Among these were FBI documents from the mid-year investigation, including electronic communications, EC, and interview reports, FD302S, agent notes from witness interviews, draft and final versions of the letterhead memorandum, LHM, for summarizing the mid-year investigation, drafts of Comey's public statement and letters to Congress, and contemporaneous notes from agents and supervisors involved in meetings about the statement and letters to Congress. We also obtained documents from prosecutors and supervisors in the Department's National Security Division, NSD, and the U.S. Attorney's Office for the Eastern District of Virginia, EDVA, as well as the Office of the Deputy Attorney General, ODAG, and the Office of the Attorney General, OAG. Importantly, among these documents were contemporaneous notes from the prosecutors and supervisors involved in the investigation. In connection with our efforts to investigate the circumstances surrounding the FBI's discovery of mid-year related emails on Anthony Weiner's laptop computer and Comey's notification to Congress on October 28, 2016, we obtained documents from NEO and SDNY personnel. These documents included forensic logs from processing of the Wiener laptop by NEO Computer Analysis and Recovery Team, CART, personnel, NEO and SDNY communications about the discovery of the emails, and other documents. We obtained communications between and among agents, prosecutors, supervisors, and FBI and department officials to understand what happened during the investigation and identify the contemporaneous factors considered in making investigative decisions. In addition to a large volume of emails, we obtained and reviewed well in excess of 100,000 text messages and instant messages to or from FBI personnel who worked on the investigation. Our review also included the examination of highly classified information. We were given broad access to relevant materials by the department and the FBI, including the sensitive compartmented information, SI discussed in the classified appendix to this report and emails and instant messages from both the FBI's top secret SCINET system and secret FBINET system. Several of the State Department emails between Secretary Clinton and her staff from the underlying mid-year investigation included information relevant to a tightly held special access program, SAP, and we did not seek or obtain the required read-ins for that program. Based on our review of emails containing redacted SAP and the FBI's explanation of the program, we determined that this information was not needed for us to make the findings in this report. Finally, and as discussed in more detail below, 
our review included information obtained in the Midyear investigation and the Anthony Weiner child exploitation investigation pursuant to grand jury subpoenas and sealed search warrants. At the Inspector General's request, the department sought court orders authorizing the release of sealed information that does not otherwise affect individual privacy interests so that we can include relevant information in this report. This information is included in the report where appropriate. 5.3. Analytical construct As noted above, the OIG undertook this review to determine, among other things, whether certain investigative decisions taken in connection with the mid-year investigation were based on improper considerations, including political bias or concerns for personal gain. In conducting this portion of our review, it was necessary to select particular investigative decisions for focused attention. It would not have been possible to recreate and analyze every decision made in a year-long complex investigation. We therefore identified particular case decisions or other incidents which were the subject of controversy. These included the use of consent agreements and voluntary interviews to obtain evidence, grants of immunity to witnesses, and the decision to allow Cheryl Mills and Heather Samuelson, two of former Secretary Clinton's attorneys, to attend her interview. During our investigation, we looked for direct evidence of improper considerations, such as contemporaneous statements in emails, memoranda, or other documents explicitly linking political or other improper considerations to specific investigative decisions. We likewise questioned witnesses about whether they had direct evidence of improper considerations affecting decision-making. As noted above, we reviewed significantly more than 1.2 million emails, text messages, and internal documents relating to the investigation, and interviewed more than 100 witnesses who were involved in the matter. We also analyzed the justifications offered for the investigative decisions we selected for focused review, including contemporaneous justifications and those offered after the fact, to determine whether they were a pretext for improper, but unstated, considerations. We conducted this assessment with appreciation for the fact that department and FBI officials were required to make numerous decisions involving complex matters daily under the unusual pressures and challenges present in the mid-year investigation. In the January 12, 2017 memorandum announcing this review, we stated, our review will not substitute the OIG's judgment for the judgments made by the FBI or the department regarding the substantive merits of investigative or prosecutive decisions. Consistent with this statement, we do not criticize particular decisions or infer that they were influenced by improper considerations merely because we might have recommended a different investigative strategy or tactic based on the facts learned during our investigation. The question we considered was not whether a particular investigative decision was perfect or ideal or one that we believed could have been handled more effectively, but whether the circumstances surrounding the decision indicated that it was based on considerations other than the merits of the investigation. If the explanations that we were given for a particular decision were consistent with a rational investigative strategy and not unreasonable, we did not conclude that the decision was based on improper considerations in the absence of evidence to the contrary. We took this approach because our role as an OIG is not to second-guess valid discretionary judgments made during the course of an investigation, and this approach is consistent with the OIG's handling of such questions in past reviews. 6. We applied this same standard as we reviewed and considered the department's declination decision, the letterhead memorandum, LHM, summarizing the investigation, and contemporaneous emails and notes reflecting analysis and discussion of legal research conducted by the prosecutors. 4. Structure of the report This report is divided into 16 chapters. Following this introduction, Chapter 2 summarizes the relevant department policies governing the release of information to the public and to Congress and the conduct of criminal investigations, as well as the relevant statutes regarding the mishandling of classified information that provided the legal framework for the mid-year investigation. In Chapter 3, we provide an overview of the mid-year investigation, including decisions about staffing and investigative strategy. In Chapter 4, we discuss the decision to publicly acknowledge the mid-year investigation and former President Obama's statements about the mid-year investigation. In Chapter 5, we discuss the conduct of the investigation, focusing on the significant investigative decisions that were subject to criticism by Congress and the public after the fact. 
In chapters 6 and 7, we describe the events leading to former Director Comey's July 5 statement and the department's decision to decline prosecution of former Secretary Clinton. Chapters 8 through 11 provide a chronology of events between the FBI's discovery of Clinton-related emails on the Wiener laptop in late September 2016 and Comey's letter to Congress on October 28, 2016, and describe the FBI's analysis of those emails and letter to Congress on November 6, 2016. Chapter 12 describes the text messages and instant messages expressing political views we obtained between certain FBI employees involved in the mid-year investigation and provides the employees' explanations for those messages. It also briefly discusses the use of personal email by several FBI employees, and provides an update on the status of the OIG's leak investigations. Chapters 13 and 14 address allegations that then-Deputy Director Andrew McCabe and then-Assistant Attorney General Peter Kadzik should have been recused from participating in certain matters, or violated the terms of their recusals. Chapter 15 addresses allegations that the timing of the FBI's release of FOIA documents and its use of Twitter to publicize the release were influenced by improper considerations or were otherwise improper. Chapter 16 includes our conclusions and recommendations. We also include a non-public classified appendix, which discusses highly classified information relevant to the mid-year investigation, Appendix 1, and a non-public law enforcement sensitive, lay, appendix containing the complete, unmodified version of Chapter 13, Appendix 2. 7. We are providing copies of our unclassified report and the classified appendix to Congress, and are publicly releasing our report without these appendices. We also are providing copies of our unclassified report to the Office of Special Counsel, OSC, for its consideration. 8. Page left intentionally blank 9. Chapter 2, Applicable Laws and Department Policies In this chapter, we describe the applicable laws, regulations, policies, and practices that govern the conduct of the mid-year investigation and are relevant to the analysis in the report. We identify specific department and FBI policies related to investigative steps taken during the mid-year investigation, overt investigative activities in advance of an election, and the disclosure of information to the media and to Congress. We also describe the department regulations governing the appointment of a special counsel. Finally, we summarize the criminal statutes relevant to the mid-year investigation. These statutes provide the legal framework for our discussion of the investigative strategy and the FBI's and Department's assessment of the evidence in subsequent chapters. I policies and laws governing criminal investigations under federal law, investigators and prosecutors are given substantial authority and discretion in conducting criminal investigations. To navigate challenges and issues that they may face during these investigations, and to assist them in exercising their authority and discretion appropriately, the department maintains the United States Attorney's Manual, USAM, as a comprehensive, quick and ready reference for attorneys responsible for the prosecution of violations of federal law. USAM 1 to 1.2000, 1 to 1.1000. In reviewing investigative decisions made during the mid year investigation, we identified several provisions of the USAM of potential relevance. The principles guiding the exercise of decisions related to federal prosecutorial discretion and those relevant to criminal prosecutions can be found within USAM Title 9 to 27.000, the principles of federal prosecution. There the department lays out guidance for federal prosecutors with the intent of ensuring the fair and effective exercise of prosecutorial discretion and responsibility by attorneys for the government and promoting confidence on the part of the public and individual defendants that important prosecutorial decisions will be made rationally and objectively on the merits of the facts and circumstances of each case. USAM 9-27.001 USAM Section 9-27.220 specifies grounds for commencing or declining prosecution stating that an attorney for the government should commence or recommend federal prosecution if he or she believes that the person's conduct constitutes a federal offense, and that the admissible evidence will probably be sufficient to obtain and sustain a conviction, unless the prosecution would serve no substantial federal interest, the person is subject to effective prosecution in another jurisdiction, or there. 
exists an adequate non-criminal alternative to prosecution. This section also states, be off as a matter of fundamental fairness and in the interest of the efficient administration of justice, no prosecution should be initiated against any person unless the attorney for the government believes that the admissible evidence is sufficient to obtain and sustain a guilty verdict by an unbiased trier of fact. 10A Grand Jury Subpoenas A federal grand jury is a group of 16 to 23 eligible citizens, empaneled by a federal court that considers evidence in order to decide if there has been a violation of federal law. Federal RCRIMP 6, A, 1. It is the responsibility of federal prosecutors to advise the grand jury on the law and to present evidence for its consideration. USAM 9-11.010 Grand jury subpoenas are one tool frequently used by federal prosecutors to collect evidence to present to a grand jury. USAM 9-11.120, Federal RCRIMP 17 There are two types of grand jury subpoenas, one, a grand jury subpoena ad testificandum which compels an individual to testify before the grand jury, and, 2, a grand jury subpoena dutzes tecum which compels an individual or entity, such as a business, to produce documents, records, tangible objects, or other physical evidence to the grand jury. GJ Manual 5.2, Federal RCRIMP 17.1 Federal prosecutors have considerable latitude in issuing grand jury subpoenas. G.J. Manual 5.4, quoting Doe v. De Genova, 779 F.2 D. 74, 80, D.C. Sir 1985. Nonetheless, the powers of the grand jury are not unlimited. G.J. Manual 5.1, quoting Brandsburg v. Hayes, 408 U.S. 665, 688, 1972. A court may quash a grand jury subpoena, upon motion, if compliance would be unreasonable or oppressive. Federal RCRIMP 17 In addition, a grand jury subpoena cannot override the invocation of a valid constitutional, common law or statutory privilege and cannot be used when a federal statute requires the use of a search warrant or other court order. G.J. Manual 5.1, quoting Brandsburg 408 U.S. at 688, and 5.6, 5.26. These limitations are discussed, insofar as they are relevant to this review, in subparts IB, IC, and 1.E of this chapter. There are also policy limitations governing the use of grand jury subpoenas. For example, the USAM provides guidelines for issuing grand jury subpoenas to attorneys regarding their representation of clients. Point two USAM 9 to 13.410. These guidelines are discussed in subpart IB of this chapter. In addition, the USAM generally advises prosecutors to consider alternatives to grand jury subpoenas, such as obtaining testimony and other evidence by consent in light of the requirement that the government maintain the secrecy of any testimony or evidence accessed through the grand jury. USAM 9-11.254-1. B. Search Warrants and 2703-D. Orders the Fourth Amendment protects individuals from unlawful searches and seizures of their property. Generally, the government must obtain a search warrant one federal grand jury practice, Office of Legal Education, October 2008, available at https slash slash dojgovernor slash uzao slash eusa slash ole slash usabuk slash oima slash index dot htm. To the USAM also provides guidelines for the use of grand jury subpoenas to obtain testimony from targets or subjects of an investigation. Target means a person as to whom the prosecutor or the grand jury has substantial evidence linking him or her to the commission of a crime and who in the judgment of the prosecutor, is a putative defendant, while subject means a person whose conduct is within the scope of the grand jury's investigation. USAM 9-11.151 11 Before searching a person's property in which the person retains a reasonable expectation of privacy. United States v. Ross, 456 U.S. 798, 822-23, 1982 Courts have held that individuals retain a reasonable expectation of privacy in data held within electronic storage devices, 
such as computers and cellular telephones. E.g., Riley v. California, 134 SCT 2473, 2485, 2014, Trulloch v. Free, 275 F.3D 391, 403, 4th Sir 2001. To obtain a search warrant pursuant to Federal Rule of Criminal Procedure 41, Rule 41 Search Warrant, the government must make a showing of facts under oath demonstrating probable cause to believe that the property to be searched contains evidence of a crime. Thus, while the government may issue a grand jury subpoena to obtain an electronic device, such as a computer or cellular telephone, the government generally will only be able to search the electronic device if it can demonstrate probable cause to believe the device contains evidence of a crime. In addition, as discussed above, a grand jury subpoena cannot be used when a federal statute requires the use of a search warrant or other court order. The Stored Communications Act provides that the government must obtain a search warrant in order to require a provider of electronic communication service to produce the contents of a subscriber's electronic communication that have been in electronic storage for 180 days or less. C-18 U.S.C. 2703, A. For the content of electronic communications that have been in electronic storage for more than 180 days, the government must usually either obtain a search warrant or provide prior notice to the subscriber or customer and obtain a court order or subpoena. 3 C 18 U.S.C. 2703, B. Thus, except for specific circumstances, in order to obtain the contents of an individual's email communications that are older than 180 days from a communications service provider such as Yahoo or Google, Gmail, without notifying the subscriber in advance, the government must first obtain a Rule 41 search warrant upon a showing of probable cause that the stored emails in possession of the provider contain evidence of a crime. Independent of whether the government can make the requisite probable cause showing to warrant a Rule 41 search warrant, the government may be able to obtain a court order pursuant to 18 U.S.C. 2703, D. 2703, D. Order. A2703, D. Order requires a communications service provider to produce information related to an individual's email account other than the content of the individual's emails, such as subscriber information and email header information. A court will issue a 2703-D order if the government offers specific and articulable facts showing that there are reasonable grounds to believe that, the records or other information sought, are relevant and material to an ongoing criminal investigation. 18 U.S.C. 2703, D. 3 under 18 U.S.C. 2703, B. 1, B. 2, the court may permit delays in noticing a subscriber slash customer for up to 90 days to avoid the adverse results listed at 18 U.S.C. 2705. Those adverse results include, a. Endangering the life or physical safety of an individual, b. Flight from prosecution, c destruction of or tampering with evidence, d, intimidation of potential witnesses, or, e, otherwise seriously jeopardizing an investigation or unduly delaying a trial. 12 C Evidence Collection Related to Attorney-Client Relationships The USAM contains guidelines for the use of subpoenas and search warrants to obtain information from attorneys related to their representation of clients. When a subpoena issued to an attorney may relate to information concerning the attorney's representation of a client, the USAM mandates additional process. USAM 9-13.410 As a preliminary matter, all reasonable attempts must be made to obtain the information from alternative sources, specifically including by consent, before issuing the subpoena to the attorney, unless such efforts would compromise the investigation. The department thereafter exercises close control over the issuance of such a subpoena. Before seeking such a subpoena, it must first be authorized by the Assistant Attorney General or a DOG Deputy Assistant Attorney General for the Criminal Division except in unusual circumstances. Before the department official can authorize the subpoena, several principles must be examined regarding the submitted draft subpoena, including all reasonable attempts to obtain the information from alternative sources shall have proved unsuccessful, the information sought is reasonably needed for the successful completion of the investigation, 
in a criminal investigation, there must be reasonable grounds to believe that a crime has been or is being committed, and that the information sought is reasonably needed for the successful completion of the investigation or prosecution, and the need for the information must outweigh the potential adverse effects upon the attorney-client relationship. USAM 9-13.410.C The intent behind this additional process is to strike a balance between an individual's right to the effective assistance of counsel and the public's interest in the fair administration of justice and effective law enforcement. USAM 9-13.410.B the department similarly exercises close control when law enforcement seeks the issuance of a search warrant for the premises of an attorney who is a subject of an investigation, and who also is or may be engaged in the practice of law on behalf of clients. USAM 9-13.420 Such a search has the potential to affect legitimate attorney-client relationships or uncover material protected by a legitimate claim of privilege. ID. Therefore, prosecutors are expected to take the least intrusive approach consistent with vigorous and effective law enforcement when evidence is sought from an attorney actively engaged in the practice of law. USAM 9-13.420.A Unless it would compromise an investigation, the USAM advises that consideration be given to obtaining needed information from other sources or through the use of consent or a subpoena, rather than issuing such a search warrant. USAM 9-13.420. A consultation with the Criminal Division and Approval 13 from an Assistant Attorney General or U.S. Attorney are required as well. USAM 9-13.420.BC The use of process to recover materials from disinterested third parties, including disinterested third-party attorneys, requires consideration of additional guidance under 28 CFR 59.1 and USAM 9-19.220. Pursuant to 28 CFR 59.1, b, it is the responsibility of federal officers and employees to protect against unnecessary intrusions. Generally, when documentary materials are held by a disinterested third party, a subpoena, administrative summons, or governmental request will be an effective alternative to the use of a search warrant and will be considerably less intrusive. Similarly, USAM 9-19.220 provides, as with other disinterested third parties, a search warrant should normally not be used to obtain confidential materials from a disinterested third party attorney. D. Use of classified evidence before a grand jury The classification of information and evidence can be another significant challenge for a federal prosecutor advising a grand jury. C. USAM 9-90.230 Because jurors lack security clearances, the disclosure of such information may only be done with the approval of the agency responsible for classifying the information. USAM 9-90.230 Though the department offers measures to increase the likelihood a classifying agency will approve the use of such information, the department encourages prosecutors to consider several alternatives to seeking such disclosures. ID. A significant number of limitations and high-level department approvals make seeking approval from the classifying agency complex, and inevitably such approval takes additional time. See USAM 9 to 90.200, 210. E immunity agreements When a witness invokes their Fifth Amendment right against self incrimination, the government must either forego the witness's incriminating testimony or offer the witness protection from prosecution resulting from such testimony, a protection known as use immunity. 28 CFR 0.175, A, CRIM Resource Manual 716. The term use immunity encompasses several degrees of legal protections for a witness, transactional immunity, formal use immunity, letter immunity, and queen for a day agreements. CRIM Resource Manual 719 1. Transactional immunity Transactional immunity offers the highest level of legal protection to a compelled witness, protecting the witness from actual prosecution for the offense, s, involved in the grand jury proceeding. CRIM Resource Manual 717 Four decades prior to 1972, the Supreme Court only recognized transactional immunity as the government vehicle to compel testimony from a witness invoking their Fifth Amendment rights. See Castigar v. United States, 
406 U.S. 441, 449 to 52, 1972. 14 2. Formal use immunity in 1970, Congress created a framework for the Department to grant formal use immunity for a witness offering testimony in a federal criminal investigation. 18 U.S.C. 6002, CRIM Resource Manual 716. Unlike transactional immunity, use immunity only protects the witness against the government's use of the immunized testimony in a subsequent prosecution of the witness, except for perjury or giving a false statement. CRIM Resource Manual 717. However, the Supreme Court subsequently found that the statutory framework creating formal use immunity also prohibits the government from using immunized testimony to discover new evidence that is then used to prosecute the witness. Castigar, 406 U.S. at 453. This additional protection is known as derivative use immunity. CRIM Resource Manual 718. Thus, the government retains the ability to prosecute a witness given formal use immunity, but only with evidence obtained independently of the witness's immunized testimony. CRIM Resource Manual 717-18 In order to do so, the government must overcome a heavy, albeit not insurmountable burden, by a preponderance of the evidence to demonstrate wholly independent discovery of such evidence. United States v. Allen 864 F.3 D63, 92, 2D Sir 2017, citing Castigar, 406 U.S. at 460. To obtain formal, court ordered use immunity, a U.S. attorney, after obtaining the approval of the Attorney General or her designee in the criminal division, seeks a court order to compel testimony of a witness appearing before the grand jury. 18 U.S.C. 6003 B, USAM 9-23.130. Such compelled testimony should be sought when the witness's testimony, in the judgment of the U.S. attorney, is necessary for the public interest and the witness is likely to invoke, or has invoked, their Fifth Amendment privilege against self-incrimination. Point four ID. The decision to grant immunity by a designated department division ultimately requires final approval from the department's criminal division. CRIM Resource Manual 720 Once the U.S. attorney receives department approval, he or she submits a motion to the judge overseeing the grand jury requesting the order to compel testimony from the witness. ID at 723 Three-letter immunity and queen-for-a-day agreements in contrast with transactional and formal use immunity a witness receiving either letter immunity or a queen for a day agreement is provided legal protections by the prosecutor pursuant to an agreement in exchange for the witness's agreement to provide testimony. CRIM Resource Manual 719 The legal for the USAM offers a non-exhaustive list of factors that should be weighed in judging the public interest, 1, the importance of the investigation or prosecution to effective enforcement of the criminal laws, 2, the value of the person's testimony or information to the investigation or prosecution, 3, the likelihood of prompt and full compliance with a compulsion order, and the effectiveness of available sanctions if there is no such compliance, 4, the person's relative culpability. In connection with the offense or offenses being investigated or prosecuted, and his or her criminal history, 5, the possibility of successfully prosecuting the person prior to compelling his or her testimony, and, 6, the likelihood of adverse collateral consequences to the person if he or she testifies under a compulsion order. USAM 9-23.210 15 protections the witness receives for voluntary testimony result from the type of agreement the witness makes with the prosecutor. ID letter immunity describes an agreement between the prosecuting office and the witness that results in a letter from the prosecuting office to the witness authorizing the grant of legal protections. Point 5 ID. While the provisions of the agreement can vary, as a general matter letter immunity, like formal immunity, only protects the witness against the government's use of the immunized testimony in a subsequent prosecution of the witness, except for perjury or giving a false statement. CRIM Resource Manual 717, C. United States v. Pelletier, 
898 f.2d 297 301 2d sir 1990 depending on the provisions of the agreement the government may retain the ability to prosecute the witness with evidence obtained independently of the witness's immunized testimony but as with formal use immunity the government bears a considerable burden in such a prosecution crim resource manual 717 to 18 see also pelletier 88 f.2d at 303 in a queen for a day agreement often referred to as a proffer agreement a witness proffers or informs prosecutors of what the witness would state under oath if called to testify and in exchange the federal prosecutor agrees to limited legal protection for the witness conditioned on the witness's truthful testimony crim resource manual 719 in a standard queen for a day agreement the government agrees not to use any statements made by the witness pursuant to the proffer agreement against the witness in its case in chief in any subsequent prosecution of the witness, or in connection with the sentencing of the witness if the witness is subsequently prosecuted and convicted. However, unlike with formal use immunity or letter use immunity, the government typically may use leads obtained from the witness's statements to develop evidence against the witness and may use the witness's statements to cross-examine the witness in any future prosecution of the witness. United States v. Stein, 440 F sub 2D 315, 322, SDNY 2006, see also Richard B. Zabel and James J. Benjamin, Jr., Queen for a Day or Courtesan for a Day. The Sixth Amendment limits to proffer agreements, 15 No. 9 White Collar Crime Republic 1, 2001. 4 Act of Production Immunity Act of Production or DOE Immunity describes a distinct type of immunity applying to a witness's production of records, instead of witness testimony. USAM 9-23.250, United States v. DOE, 465 U.S. 605, 1984. The production of records by a witness in response to a grand jury subpoena potentially implicates the right against self-incrimination if the fact that the witness produced the records could be used against the witness in a future prosecution as an admission of the existence and possession of the records. USAM 9-23.250 The department uses the same procedure to grant act of production immunity as it does for formal use immunity producing a formal letter authorizing the U.S. attorney to make a motion for a judicial order to compel the production of specifically enumerated records in five the reach of the legal protections offered in such a letter may vary, with some instances of letter immunity being restricted to the jurisdiction of a particular U.S. attorney and others applying in multiple districts or extending nationwide, typically with the agreement of the other prosecutors. 16 Exchange for not using the witness act of production against the witness in a subsequent prosecution of the witness. ID, CRIM Resource Manual 722. Alternatively, the prosecutor can enter into a letter agreement with the individuals. In either situation, the act of production immunity does not provide any protection for the witness from a future prosecution. Two department policies and practices governing investigative activities in advance of an election department policies require all department officials to enforce the laws, in a neutral and impartial manner and to remain particularly sensitive to safeguarding the department's reputation for fairness, neutrality, and nonpartisanship. Six various policies also address investigative activities timed to affect an election and require that prosecutors and agents consult with the criminal. Division's Public Integrity Section PIN, before taking overt investigative steps in advance of a primary or general election. No department policy contains a specific prohibition on overt investigative steps within a particular period before an election. Nevertheless, various witnesses testified that the department has a long-standing unwritten practice to avoid overt law enforcement and prosecutorial activities close to an election, typically within 60 or 90 days of election day. We discuss relevant department policies and practices below. A election year sensitivities policy in 2008, 2012, and 2016, the then Attorney General issued a memorandum to remind all department employees of the department's existing policies with respect to political activities. Seven these memoranda are substantially similar. Each memorandum contains two sections.